Perceive, process, perform. Do you need inspiration for your practice? Or do you simply need to practice inspiration? With this series, we aim to do both. Give us 15 minutes and we'll give you practice inspiration. Dr. Jeff Rouse maintains a full-time private practice and is an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. He lectures internationally on sleep prosthodontics and its impact on dentistry. In this presentation, he discusses how to find and fix patients with sleep dentistry issues. Howdy, I'm Jeff Rouse. I'm a prosthodontist in San Antonio, Texas. I want to thank my Seattle Study Club family, especially Michael Cohen, for the opportunity to present at the Speaker Spotlight 2015. Now, the idea behind this is it's really difficult to put together a program for your clubs when you haven't heard the speakers speak. So this is going to give you a sense of my presentation style. I'm also going to highlight some of the courses that I can do for your clubs if you happen to invite me there. Now, the staff has told me that what I really ought to speak about is something I know quite well, my best topic, the one that I'm most familiar with, because it provides the most powerful presentation. I thought about it and decided the thing I know best is actually me. So I'm going to tell you about me and my journey. Now, it's not just about that I love fly fishing or good red wine. What I'm going to focus on is actually that in my restorative practice, Sleep and airway really impact every patient I see. If you want me to come to your club and focus on how to market sleep dentistry to sleep physicians and how to make 60 or 80 oral appliances in a month, I'm not your guy. If you want somebody to come into your club and say, here's the way that sleep and airway really impacts the restorative dentistry practice, the orthodontic practice, the perio practice and oral surgery practice, now I might have something for you. Because in 2004, I started a research project in my office. My focus was about wear on teeth, broken ceramic, and people that needed rehabilitation. It was very quickly evident to me that we were asking the wrong question. You need to start with a different question, not how. That's the one we've always asked. How did it happen? How are we going to manage it? And then how are we going to keep it from happening again? How? Yeah, it's an important question because we're restorative dentists and we've got to actually fix people. But there's a more important question to begin with, which is actually, why? Now think about it. If I ask a how question, I'm asking for the mechanics of the equation. And that's what dentists are comfortable with, but there's a better question, which is biology. What caused it to happen? If you can ask, why did it happen? Now you get to the biologic link. And if you can get to the biologic link, not only is the dentistry going to be preserved, but the patient is going to be protected as well. So if I'm going to switch your group, from how to why, we got to do some different things. We got to back up from the patient a little bit. We got to look at them differently than we have before. And we got to ask them some different questions in our examination process. We also got to go beyond the teeth. The teeth are just where we focus, but there's answers well behind the teeth that you can find if you simply look. And the third thing we've got to do is we've got to have new tools. We got to go beyond the articulator. We actually need things like pulse oximetry and cardiopulmonary coupling to screen our patients. So first thing we do, switch your dentist from how to why. Next thing, probably the most important thing that I can do, I'm going to introduce them to the three patients, three patients. Now, if I do nothing but get them to analyze the different patient groups and learn who to send those things to for referrals, it would have been a valuable day for your club. The three patients, first patient is children. Children's airway issues are totally different than any adult airway issue. You see, children are really good at fixing their airways and rarely are going to become apneic. And yet those minor fragmentations of sleep that they have all the time, those actually impact them quite dramatically. When their brain is growing and their body is growing, they can suffer from systemic, craniofacial, and neurocognitive problems very easily. Second group, that's our resistance group. Resistance groups are young, fit females. If you look in the medical literature for them, you're going to find them under the term upper airway resistance syndrome, UARS. Now let's look for that same person in the dental literature and we find them in the TMD literature or myofascial pain. 
You see, these are the people that suffer from depression, anxiety, muscle pain, headache. These are the patients we've been making splints on for years, looking for mechanical answers to a biologic problem. Third group, I call them the fat old men. They come into your practice, they have wear on their teeth and erosion on their teeth, but the third component of this bruxism triad is they have apnea. So the rehab patient, the one that you're doing routinely, is actually gonna have a sleep component. You need to not only make the dentistry good, but you need to make the patient healthy. So I'll introduce your patients to that and your dentist to that as well. That lecture is called Sleep Prosthodontics, but a better way to think of it is find Jake. So who's Jake? Jake's actually my 10-year-old. See, Jake had airway issues from the moment he was born. I just didn't know it. I was about a year and a half behind in figuring it out. So every time he had a problem, I just didn't know what was going on. Three surgeries and a bunch of ortho later, he's almost fixed, but Jake will suffer a lifetime of me missing the problem. Jake has ADHD, he's got dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia. So Jake would be different if I knew this information before. Now, when we focus on Jake, it doesn't have to be a 10-year-old kid. It can be a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, your best friend. It can be kids or grandkids as well, obviously. But it could be you. So we're going to find Jake and learn what to do with Jake, where to get him to get help. That's usually where we stopped with most of the study clubs in the past. That was a one course we were all done. But people kept bugging. I mean, they would email me constantly about, oh, you need to help me fix this person. You need to help me fix. And it's probably the most amazing thing and experience that I've had in doing dentistry is actually the gratitude coming from the people in your study club. So I decided to do the next course, which is how to fix Jake. So we're going to find him. The next course is we're going to fix him. Now, if we're fixing Jake and they're an adult, the obvious answer is we make them an oral appliance. And we'll show you how to make them and how to choose them and how to titrate them and all the problems associated with them, how to manage those things. But that's maintaining a problem. Really, my focus is different than anyone else I think lecturing about this topic. I don't want to maintain anymore. I want to fix them. I want to resolve the problem. So we're going to spend a significant amount of time in your study club talking about ortho, surgically facilitated ortho, and orthognathic surgery. Throw in ENT surgery, and you have some resolution solutions. So those are the first two courses that we do on our continuum of courses for Seattle Study Club. Let's get back to me now. What happened with me is I went in and got a diagnosis, and sure enough, Jake was me. I had an apnea level somewhere between mild and moderate, and I made two big changes right away. First change I made was in my diet. Dean Ornish presented the Seattle Study Club Symposium. He said there are three things you need to become healthy. First is you need a good diet. Second is you need exercise. And the third is you need the love of friends and family. I went back and immediately became a vegan, which cost me the love of friends and family. So I switched it to vegetarian. Now, I travel a lot, and that still isn't really the greatest. Think about being vegetarian on Thanksgiving. Think about being it when you go to your study club and you take me to dinner at your favorite steak joint and I have to have a piece of asparagus. So I added fish into my diet. Feeling better, looking better, I think that's a great diet for me. Second thing I did, I made an oral appliance for myself. But I am like all people with human, the human nature of wearing an appliance. About two and a half years into it, I was tired of it. I was at that time about 51 years old, and I said, enough's enough. I'm not going to live the rest of my life sticking a piece of plastic in my mouth every night. Yes, it works, but i got to have something different. i got to have something better. So I was at a position where I said, this is the time in my life to make a change. And the change we decided to make is I needed to grow the box. I needed to make more airway. So I had craniofacial problems that were, from an aesthetic dental standpoint, had been taken care of with veneers years before. So in 1987, I had veneers placed on my teeth. They did a good job of aesthetically masking some of the problems that I had. Now, as a dentist, you can see the problems. You can see that depression, sort of an airway-based occlusion type of problem. But step one in my evolution and revolution is I had to cut the veneers off. I had to get back to where I was before. So that was our first thing that we did, is we got the veneers cut off. And then you can look at the arch form and tell there's an airway problem there. You see normal-shaped arches that were developed with the tongue in the roof of the mouth, breathing through your nose, do not develop in a V-shape. It's impossible. So if this was a denture, what I would do to it is I would warm the wax, I'd move the teeth, expand the arch, and actually I would change the mold of the teeth 
because the teeth are too narrow. By doing that expansion, I'm going to also improve the airway. So I went to my orthodontist and I said, that's what I want to do. That's what I would do with the denture, do it to my mouth. But the orthodontist said, I'm limited by the bone. If you push the teeth out, you're going to go right past the bone and we can't do that, Jeff. Now, there's a revolution going on in ortho right now as well that we'll talk to your study club about. The revolution is exactly the same revolution that happened in surgery. You see, in 1988, when I started doing implant dentistry, I would get cases back where the implants were in horrible positions and the surgeon's note would say that's where there was bone. By the mid-90s, we no longer accepted that's where there's bone. We said grow the bone. I don't get implants in the wrong place anymore. We grow the bone, we make it happen. Well, that's what's happening in orthodontics now. If you need the teeth out in a position, you grow the bone. And so that's what we decided to do. So we went in and put some buttons on for Invisalign and did the surgery. It was a surgically facilitated ortho. We did corticotomy cuts. We added a significant amount of bone. We ended up creating the RAP effect, rapid accelatory phenomenon that is resolving around or revolving around creating inflammation. Now, I did a really lousy job of managing my inflammation. That swelling is my fault, but just so that you know, there was absolutely not a moment's worth of pain involved. It took me seven days for the inflammation to go down. We're continuing to use Invisalign rather than regular brackets. The idea here is I can change these trays out every two days. So I'm constantly applying force to the teeth. We have TADS in there to start working on the class three bite. And I'm using an Accelident um, device in order to create vibration on the teeth that takes the wrap effect and extends it a few more weeks. That's what I'm doing to my mouth. And four weeks, or excuse me, four months into it, we're getting some resolution. We're changing things. Now remember, I needed to change the mold of my teeth, which means I needed to create space between my teeth. And I wanted expansion, not only in a transverse dimension, but in an AP dimension. And we're getting there. We're making some change, but we're not all the way there for sure. So if you're not all the way there, what do you do? Well, of course, you do the surgery again. So in August, we went back in and redid the surgery, did the corticotomy cuts, put more bone in place, and there we are. So seven months of actual treatment time later, we've done what? Well, the answer is not create an ugly smile. The answer is we created the space that we needed in order to do what I wanted done. So we're going to have to show the orthodontist how to finish the case from here. But before we get to that, I want to show you the change we made. You see, this was an airway-induced in malocclusion that I had in my mouth. And we used the third molars as anchorage points, so they didn't move at all. That's the expansion we were able to achieve. Let's do it again. That's where I started. That's where I was when I was ready for the provisionals. Now, why is that so important? It's incredibly important because the new literature out of the world of airway tells us that if I create the expansion I need to get the tongue out of a low posture and up into my mouth, I can breathe through my nose. Why is breathing through your nose important? Because you don't get apnea when you breathe through your nose. Two and a half times less collapsible airway. It's the simple use of decongestants can resolve apnea in some patients. The most famous sleep physician in the world says you're not done with the case until they can breathe through their nose 24-7. Nasal breathing is incredibly important. And now what did I do? I created the volume to allow me to actually do that. Problem was, I'm now 52, and I've never in my life been breathing through my nose all night long. So I need some physical therapy. In fact, we teach your group how to do that as well. It's called the Buteco breathing technique. It's actually designed for all day long, but there's a nighttime application where you do use some tape. Now I know it looks silly putting a piece of tape on your mouth, but that piece of tape has given me the best night's sleep I've ever had. Now, we've done ortho. We're gonna do the veneers in a minute. We're doing the mouth taping. If all of that doesn't still resolve my airway issue, I have a deviated septum that can be fixed. Once again, we're going to talk about ENT surgeries to your group to show them what the ENT can do for them. Now, outside of the booklet, not listed as courses that I teach, are things that I do every day in my practice. I'm a prosthodontist, and I teach our residents how to do these things. So we can teach hands-on courses and actually how to mock this thing up. The other thing that is part of our teaching curricula is an airway-based occlusion, meaning that old occlusal philosophies were built off the mechanical principles Today, we have an airway-derived occlusal scheme that we can share with your group as well. Now, I think it's made a nice change. And aesthetically, it's it made a significant improvement for me. But that's really not all that important. You see, if it was the big stage at Seattle Study Club, I'd probably cut it off right there because it's such a cool-looking difference between the two, even though we're not done, right? 
I still have some work to do on the upper arch in order to finalize the ortho and do the veneers. But that's not really all that's important. The next slide, while more boring to your eye, is more important to the person. I don't have apnea anymore. So I went from a person that was dying young with this apnea to a person that's going to live forever, I hope. Why? Because I got a lot of cool things still left to do in my life, and I got a lot of memories that I'd like to have. Hopefully some of those memories are with y'all. Thank you.